Would you all pray with me as we prepare? God, we thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus, our Lord, to be born, to live, to walk among us, to teach us, to show us what it is to love, what it is to live in your will. And so today we ask that you would teach us, that you would open our eyes and our ears and help us to see this story with new eyes, to hear something new straight from you this day, to help us understand your will for our lives more fully and to live into it with more trust and more faith. We give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So some of my favorite memories of Christmas are all of the funny things that happen at churches around Christmas and specifically around those Christmas pageants each year. So one of the very first churches that I worked in uh, while I was in seminary was in Brady, Texas, uh, right in the center of Texas. It's one and only claim to fame that it's the geographical center of Texas. Uh, and they had this outdoor drive-through pageant each year. And so it was a tradition that the whole town seemed to look forward to. Uh, and so the setup was pretty involved. It involved this a homemade stable that set up uh, along the edge of the parking lot. It was a rough stable built for Mary and Joseph to make their way to, and, and uh, it also served as a screen to hide all of the electronics and the switches and things uh, in the back. There were switches to control the lights, so it would light up different parts of the story at different times, and there was this recorded music and narration that would play over the loudspeakers. And so my very first Christmas there, as the youth minister, I got the job of running the lights and the sound. And there was this small little cutout in the, in the back of the stable where you could look through and see where the actors were so you knew when to change the lights in order to follow them along. Now, in addition to around 15 youth and adult actors, there were also numerous animals in this production. Most of them were sheep and goats, and they were tied in and around this little stable. And then there was a pen set up next to it with a, a cow sitting in there. And then there was this infamous donkey that Mary rode in on. Now, I had heard many stories, many stories about this donkey from years past, but I was not prepared for what was about to happen. This parking lot filled up with, with cars from all around town, and it was time to start the show. So I started the taped music, and, and uh, the music filled the air, and the narration started that there was a census, and Mary and Joseph had to make their way to Bethlehem to be counted and to pay their taxes. And so I, I turned, and I looked, and I see Joseph helping Mary onto the donkey, and then I turned on the first switch, and the lights came on, and, and there they were, and they began to make their way over toward the stable. As the narration and the music continues, the music begins to build, and, and so I turn on the next set of lights as they enter into that, and then turn off the lights where they had just been. It was a thing of beauty. And then, the donkey decided that he had gone far enough. Stopped right there in his tracks. And I could see through the little cutout that the high school boy, Joseph, was pulling and tugging on that rope with everything he had, and that donkey was not about to budge. And then Joseph picked up a stick he found on the, on the floor there and swatted the donkey, and the donkey jumped up, and Mary, who was sitting side saddle, fell over backwards with her legs up in the air and landed in the dirt, which must have frightened the donkey because the donkey took off running at that point, knocked over part of the pen that housed the cow, and ran across the parking lot out into the grass. Now angels, who are supposed to appear later in the story, came running from everywhere <laughs> to chase the donkey, to rebuild the pens before the cow could get out, and of course to check on poor Mary, who was laying in the dirt, hysterically laughing. <laughs> now, I had done some theater in high school, so I knew a little bit about what to do here. Because I knew there's one thing that's always true, and that's that the show must go on. And so I let that music and that narration continue to play, and I continued with my light cues right on time. And by the time Silent Night began to play, there was this beautiful scene with Mary and Joseph 
and the baby Jesus surrounded by peaceful animals and angels from on high. Now, to say things didn't go exactly as planned would be an understatement, uh, but in the end, uh, this story was told, and we celebrated a miraculous birth. And cars were honking and waving as they drove off into the night, and we began to reset everything so that we could do it all again as soon as the parking lot filled up once more. And baby, you're sitting there and wondering why in the world would Ronnie tell us this long, drawn-out story? It's because things rarely go as planned. Can I get an amen to that? In fact, one of my favorite or least favorite sayings, because it's so true, is the saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. God's plan or will and our plan often don't line up. That's when it's important for us to hold on tight to our faith and to trust God. Let's look at our scripture for today. If you would turn in your Bible or grab one of the pew Bibles or read off of the screen up there, the, uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 18. This is when Je- uh, uh, Joseph finally accepts Jesus as his son. Beginning in verse 18, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, a, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her and do it quietly. But after he had considered all of this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Remember what I just said about God's plans and our plans? I'm pretty sure this is not how Mary and Joseph planned their engagement to go. Now, it's important for us to remember that engagements in this uh, time were, were not at all like engagements are today. Most likely, Joseph's parents had uh, made arrangements with Mary's parents that, they would be, uh, that she would be his wife when she was old enough to marry. And this plan had probably been arranged when they were just small children. They had no part in choosing each other, but during this year of engagement, they would get to know one another. They would start to plan for their future. Legally, it was like they were already married, but they, they didn't live together. They didn't consummate their relationship until after the marriage ceremony. It really is different than what we think of as an engagement today. When two people find each other, they begin to date and fall in love, and then one asks the other to get married with much fear and trembling, hoping that the other will say yes. Often these days, there's some elaborate scene that's recorded and posted online for everyone to watch. Uh, Sometimes the guy will still go and ask the father of the bride if he can marry his daughter, uh, but that's about as close to parents being involved in the choosing of a spouse as it gets. But for Mary and Joseph, it was all arranged. It was all arranged by their parents, and now, even though it had been all arranged and was out of their control, they're entering into this this time of engagement, this year of getting to know each other, this most exciting time before their marriage. They're engaged and they can begin to plan their life together. They can begin to dream together about their family and make plans about where they will live and begin to set up a house that they will share after the marriage. This year of engagement was was this exciting time when the two had been chosen by their parents to be married, finally get to know each other, and finally get to put some of their own plans, their own dreams, into this relationship. Uh-oh. Did, did you hear that? Make plans. 
God started laughing. That's when God shows up. God sends an angel. And I mean, they had plans. They were already dreaming of what their life together was going to be like. And then Gabriel shows up with God's plan. Mary hears God's plan. And after a few questions about just how this is going to happen, she finally says, let it be to me just as you have said. Now, Joseph's reaction was just a little bit different. I mean, Mary turns up pregnant and he knows that it's not his. And so Mary has this crazy story about some angel of God showing up and the Holy Spirit uh, putting this baby in her. And the baby is going to be God's son, but Joseph just can't believe it, can't deal with it. And so he makes plans to divorce her, but to do it quietly because he really does care about Mary. And so all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their plans are gone. Joseph can no longer trust Mary and doesn't want to be married to her. He's certain that she's been unfaithful to him. I don't think we ever really stop and think about just how intense this situation must have been. We jump right over this to the birth and all the the celebrations and the shepherds and the wise men and the angels singing and all of that. But this was a painful and frightening time for Mary and Joseph. All of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their plans of what the future would look like have been destroyed by this one action of God. And Joseph is ready to call it quits. And then the Lord appears to Joseph. And the Lord explains the situation before he divorces Mary. And so Joseph, in an act of incredible faith, decides to go through with the marriage, to name the baby Jesus and to raise the baby as his own. Now the Reverend uh, Dan Stiers made these three observations about this story. He says, God did not ask permission, but God just told them the plan. And number two, God's plan for Mary and Joseph was not an easy plan. And number three, though things were difficult, God blessed them all the way through. So let's look at those those three things. God didn't ask permission, but just told them the plan. Wouldn't it be nice if God would show up to us to see if God's plan and our plans lined up before setting this plan into motion? It sure sounds nice. But the angel shows up to Mary and tells her the plan. He doesn't end the conversation with a question like, does that sound okay to you? Or are you good with this plan, Mary? No, God simply reveals God's plan to us, and then it's up to us what we're going to do with that plan. Joseph could have said no to God's plan, could have followed through with that divorce and abandoned Mary and her pregnancy and moved on with his life, moved on with his life plan. But he would have missed out on being one of the ones who helped raise the Messiah. In faith, Joseph accepted God's plan, and even even though it was hard, he was blessed by it. Mary, in her pregnancy, had had moved on. Let's see, I just skip the line, sorry. I think sometimes we have this idea that if we're living in God's will or doing God's plan in our lives, then our lives will be easy. They'll be without any kind of struggle or pain. We often judge others and sometimes judge ourselves as being unfaithful or having some problem or sin in our lives when we have hardships that come at us. If we're in a painful or hard situation, we often think, what have I done? Why is God punishing me? I don't know where that idea comes from exactly because it's not from Jesus' teachings. It's not from Jesus' life story, that's for sure. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are persecuted, blessed are those who are peacemakers and meek. He never says blessed are those who have more than enough money. Blessed are those who who have no struggle in this life. Blessed are those who make plans and follow through with them. I do believe that God has a plan for your life. 
and it's a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But God's plan, that plan, doesn't always, in fact, rarely lines up with the plans we have for our own lives. But when we can trust God, when we can accept God's will and the circumstances that come in our lives to lead us and guide us into God's will, then we can begin to live, live a life of faith. A life that's not dependent on our comfort or our success, but on our faithfulness to God. To the God whose plan for our lives is better than our plan whose plan for our life is better than our plan, our hopes, our dreams, all of those combined could ever be. But it takes work. It takes work, it takes faith, and it's always worth it. The second thing is that God's plan for Mary and Joseph was not an easy plan. Look at, look at this story for just a minute. I mean, if God is all-powerful and, and to be in God's will is to, truly supposed to be easy and, uh, and nothing too hard to do with it. As we oftentimes uh, convince ourselves it should be, then let's, let's try to explain some of these circumstances of God's son's birth. I mean, why couldn't Mary and Joseph be counted and pay their taxes where they were? Why did they have to travel all the way to Bethlehem? I mean, God could have worked that out. Or even simpler than that, God could have simply waited until after the census and the taxes had been paid for Mary to become pregnant. That makes sense to me. But instead, God chose to have her travel on a donkey, which is not so easy, if you remember the story before, all the way to Bethlehem. And while she's traveling, she's so pregnant that she barely made it into town before giving birth. And even then, once she gets there, there's no room for her to stay in this nice inn, so she gives birth in a filthy stable out back. It seems to me that God did nothing in this situation to make it easy or to make it comfortable. But God wanted them to trust. God wanted them to follow the plan. We can look back now and see how all of those things fulfill the prophecies. They help to ensure that other people will believe that Jesus is the promised one, the Messiah. But for Mary and Joseph, it was a terribly uncomfortable time in their lives. And the third and last thing is that though things were difficult, God blessed them all the way through. Can you imagine the pride and joy that Mary and Joseph must have felt as they watched Jesus grow in wisdom and stature. As he began to interpret the scriptures, as he began to heal the sick and do miraculous things, Mary must have recalled the angel telling her that she had found favor with God in those moments. But haven't you found these things to be true in your life as well? God often leads us down these difficult paths to God's will. And it's only when we can look back on, on all the things that have happened that we can get a sense of how God's plan was in it all, that God was blessing us through it all. See, God's plan is often difficult. And God's plan rarely lines up with our plans. But it is always perfect for us in the end. Our job is simply to trust to have faith, even in the difficult times, knowing that God is at work doing something that will benefit us and something that will benefit the kingdom of God in the end. Living in God's will is not always easy, but it's always worth it. Amen.